Thank you, John. Uh, John Walshons and I go back 31 years when he was front man for Ram Dass back in 1981 for many years. We became immediate soul brothers because we have shared mentors over the years. And he was, John was educated in Florida with his formal education, but his three primary mentors have been Ram Dass, whom he met in 1973, and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and Stephen Levine, who he met in 1976. So give a nice welcome to John Welshans, please. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lex, and thank you all. Good morning. Good morning. How nice to be with you all. I just turned 62, so I figured if I'm qualified for Social Security, I can sit down when I lecture. <laughs> now, I actually already, always have sat down when I lectured, but now I have an excuse. <laughs> and we have a blank screen for this presentation. And there are two reasons for that. One was that I didn't get my PowerPoint presentation prepared quickly enough. And the other is that uh, blank screen is actually a beautiful image for what we're going to talk about today. Because um, in the mystical traditions of the East, of Buddhism and Hinduism, um, and even looking into some of the mystical traditions of the West in Christianity and Judaism, and even in the Sufi tradition in Islam. Um, the explanation of our identity as human beings is essentially analogous to, well, it's in various traditions described differently. I'm going to focus primarily on Buddhism and Hinduism, and I'm going to take a few shortcuts today. So thankfully, most of you aren't theologians. Most of us in the room are psychologists and therapists and so on. So uh, you won't shoot me <laughs> for the shortcuts I'm going to take, because I'm, going to, I'm not going to get too deeply into the differences between Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, one of the things I'll say at the outset is that Buddhism is often misidentified as an atheistic tradition. And in essence, what the Buddha said was not that there is no God. He said that if there is a God, which there very well might be, how could our human minds ever understand what that is? If there is a God, it would have to be so vast and so extraordinary and so incomprehensible. Something that could create this universe? Quite remarkable. So... <laughs> Thank you. I got a saggy microphone here. <laughs> Thank, beautiful. Thank you. That may work. Thanks, John. Um, and then the Buddha said, look what happens when we try to understand it. Look what complications we create. You know, we start to argue about whose idea of God is right. And pretty soon we're fighting with each other and eventually killing each other over whose idea of God is right. So Buddha said, better we shouldn't confuse ourselves that way. <laughs> because whatever it is would have to be in everything. And if we learn to experience everything as it is, in the moment it's happening, we probably will experience whatever this thing is we call God. Now, that's an interesting statement because in the Vedas, which are the most ancient texts in Hinduism, out of which the whole tradition of Vedanta grew, um, 
in the Vedas, there is the statement that if you could bring your attention fully to exactly what's happening in this moment, if you could bring your attention fully to exactly what's happening in this moment, you would see God. Wow. So when we begin to talk about attention, which Philip started to talk about so eloquently and articulately, and uh, which Anne Klein is going to discuss more this afternoon, we start to see how significant the ability to be attentive is. And it's important not just in relationships, but in finding our own inner peace, in finding our own inner joy, in finding our own happiness. I read an article not too long ago about, uh, I'm going to try something else here. It's an article about multitasking. Anyone in this room familiar with multitasking? <laughs> now, it's kind of fascinating, you know, in the sense that we live in a culture that now essentially expects us to be able to do five different things at once. And we're raising children to do that. Now, the interesting thing, this was a psychological study. Some of you are probably familiar with it. A bunch of child psychologists got together and studied multitasking, trying to find out whether it was beneficial or detrimental to human development. And it was an interesting set of conclusions they came to because, first of all, it appeared that the psychologists who didn't really care for multitasking were generally 45 years old and above. The ones who thought it was a good thing were 45 years and younger. The one thing that they all agreed on was that we're raising now probably a second generation of children who seem to have an absolute inability to cope with silence and inactivity. And when I read that, I thought, well, that's kind of fascinating because I don't know any path to inner peace that doesn't require the ability to be silent and inactive for certain specified periods of time. So in other words, if we're creating so much agitation in the environment that everybody has to be busy doing, doing, doing all the time, constant stimulation coming in from the outside, external stimulation, how do we find the place of inner peace? Now, the question is interesting because the, the identities that I mentioned in Buddhism and Hinduism, and again through many of the other mystical traditions uh, in the West, but in Buddhism and Hinduism, basically what we're looking at is in Hinduism, now I'll mention something about Hinduism that's often a misunderstanding, and that is that Hinduism is often misidentified as a, a polytheistic religion, meaning it, Hinduism believes in many gods. The truth is, in Hinduism, there's only one God, and that God is known as Brahman, B-R-A-H-M-A-N. Then all of the multitudinous deities that are revered and worshipped in Hinduism are seen as different aspects of the personality of the one God. And so, for instance, in the tradition that I've practiced for over 40 years, um, I practice, I do Buddhist meditation and Hindu devotional practices. So in the, pra the tradition that I follow, which is the tradition of the worship of Hanuman, and Hanuman is the 
uh, God who is the perfect servant of Ram, the perfect servant of one of the incarnations of God. In other words, if you follow Hanuman, the aspiration is to become a perfect servant of God. But that's just one dimension of Hinduism. Now, uh, last night I was having a conversation with a lovely woman who was raised in the Baha'i faith. And she shared with me that one of the things that's done in the Baha'i faith is to pray for tests, to pray for challenges, to pray to be expanded, to pray to reach our deepest and highest potential. And I thought, well, that's similar to the Shaivite tradition in Hinduism, where there's also in Hinduism a trinity, but the trinity in Hinduism is the, the creator, the preserver, and the destroyer, named Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And there are sects in India known as Shaivites who worship Shiva. And basically, Shiva as the destroyer, see in the West we see destruction as a negative, whereas in the East, the process of destruction is seen simply as the way it is. Things are created, they have an existence for a period of time, they change, and they pass away. They're destroyed. Nothing lasts forever. These bodies, these buildings, our cars, our homes. I live in New Jersey where we just had Hurricane Sandy. Holy mackerel. Every now and then I think Mother Nature likes to remind us that we really can't control things the way we think we can. And that's an interesting insight. It's an interesting insight. So, um, our identity in these systems, if we look at Hinduism, which basically says in the Vedantic tradition, who we truly are is Atman. And Atman is like a little drop of Brahman that exists in each of us. We sometimes refer to it as our soul. And in the Eastern traditions, our individual soul is identical with the one soul, which is Brahman. So we experience ourselves as individual because this essence is born into these bodies and these bodies come equipped with a mind and a personality and a whole physical identity and we look down and we, at some point we start to see oh my goodness this is who I am and everybody in the environment is reinforcing this is who you are. Now, I love that Philip was talking about the Dalai Lama this morning because I always think that we're all so blessed to live on earth at a time when this man is functioning as the Dalai Lama. He's quite an extraordinary being. If you think of who he is, when we're looking at joy and suffering, the Dalai Lama recruited out of his home to become the Dalai Lama because the seers in the Tibetan tradition saw that that's who he was, and so they came to his parents and said, by the way, you just gave birth to the Dalai Lama, we need to take him to Lhasa and train him. And, you know, as Phil and I were dialoguing last night, they were kind enough to take his parents with them, which they don't always do with lamas. But, um, so he's taken out of his home, he's trained to be the Dalai Lama. At the age of 14, he's already negotiating with Mao Zedong, about the future of Tibet. The negotiation didn't go very well. I mean, he was only 14 years old, and the next thing he knew, he had his country stolen from him, from he and his people. And they were driven out in the most methodically cruel and brutal manner. He saw this as a child. He wound up having to flee the country and was given, offered, uh, asylum in India and has been living in India in exile from his own country for over 50 years. Now having seen what he's seen and having been deceived the way he was deceived and having watched his people slaughtered in the way they've been slaughtered, you'd think if there was ever a being who had a right to be, to be angry 
to be resentful, it would be him. And yet he smiles all the time. Fascinating. And it isn't a phony smile. He has somehow found out how to find joy in the midst of extraordinary suffering. And that's really the great teaching he offers us. Now, he's quite an amazing individual. And in one of the conferences that Phil mentioned, the Dalai Lama likes to have at least once a year a conference with scientists and or psychotherapists, uh, just exploring how the teachings of Buddhism interact with the understandings of the scientific world. Because one of the wonderful things that he said, once I saw him asked, if Buddhism, or if science, discovered something that disproved a basic tenet of Buddhism, what would you do? And the Dalai Lama said, Buddhism would have to change. Because Buddhism isn't a belief system. Buddhism is about a search for truth. What is true? What is real? What is lasting? And then he very humorously said, I don't think it'll happen. <laughs> because of the way that the truths that Buddhism understands are rooted in actual experience. The Buddha himself always taught, don't take what I say on faith. Here's the path that I use to have the experience that I have. You can try it. See what happens. See for yourself what happens. And again, you know, in my dialogue, we had such a nice visit last night. We had quite a pizza party. I think you were all invited. Where were you? <laughs> you didn't come because we didn't offer CEUs last night? <laughs> we had pizza. What more do you want? <laughs> but it's very interesting because Phil was sharing with me his own experience of uh, going and doing a uh, meditation course and seeing what came out of that. That's really the tradition of Buddhism. Try it. See what happens. So I've been doing these practices for 43 years. And um, as I was listening to Phil's um, wonderful presentation this morning, I was thinking, well, my parents gave me an absolutely complete experience of life. Because with my parents, I had secure attachment, I had uh, uh, anxious attachment, and I had avoidant attachment. So we covered all bases. <laughs> and I've dealt with all three in my adult life. And um, so my parents, since this is a conference on spirituality and health, um, my parents were married by Norman Vincent Peale. Oh, you see, there's always a wave of who's and ahs that goes through the audience until I tell you that if were he alive today, I'm sure Dr. Peel would say they were the most difficult couple he ever dealt with. <laughs> I know they were the most difficult couple I've ever dealt with, so. Uh, Dr. Peel, um, my parents had a, a three-hour argument on their wedding day, so which postponed their marriage ceremony by three hours. When the argument was over, they had 250 people waiting in the church and the Waldorf Astoria waiting to give them their, their reception. When the argument was over, my mother finally said, all right, I'll marry him. And they went to get Norman Vincent Peale and his secretary said, Dr. Peale has gone to dinner. He said, if that crazy couple decides to get married, tell them I'll be back at 7 o'clock. <laughs> so that was the beginning of my family, just to give you some idea. Now, my parents were both very serious alcoholics, and um, after I was born, my father decided, when I was about six months old, that my mother was an unfit mother, and he was going to take me to meet his real friends, who all hung out in the bars that he hung out in. And it happened to be the middle of winter, and um, he had neglected to even take a blanket to cover his new baby in, that he was going to show off at his to all his drinking buddies. And when he got home at four o'clock in the morning, he at least remembered to bring me back with him. And he realized the next morning what he had done. He said, I have to get sober. 
and checked himself into a hospital known as Fair Oaks in New Jersey. And um, spent a, in a six week program, detox program, got sober and got involved in AA. So now he and my, and my mother joined him. So they were now sober from my from time I was six months on. When I was three, I contracted one of the last cases of polio in the United States. And um, I was in an isolation hospital in New Jersey and um, in a coma for three weeks. The doctor said to my parents, you must prepare yourselves, your son is gonna die. There's a 99% chance he's gonna die. If he doesn't die, there's a 95% chance he'll be in an iron lung for the rest of his life. Many of you probably don't even know what an iron lung is, but um, it's a big respirator. You, you lay on your back for the rest of your life with this machine that breathes for you because the form of polio I had destroyed the neuromuscular system connected with respiration. Interesting that later in life I do a meditation practice that focuses on breathing. You know, very, I'm a very happy breather. <laughs> but this was very interesting. So my father said, well, there must be something we can do. The doctor said, no, there's nothing we can do. And so he's, finally one of the doctors said, well, you can pray. So my father, who was a very successful entrepreneur, never did anything in a small way. So he went home and he got on the phone and within a period of time, he had contacted 250 friends and family and business associates and basically said, will you please pray for our son in whatever tradition you practice? About four days later, my father was praying one night in our home, two o'clock in the morning, he has a vision of Jesus standing next to my bed in the hospital, smiling with his hand on my forehead. My father wakes up, he thinks, that's gotta be good. <laughs> he runs in and wakes up my mother and he says, uh, don't worry, John is gonna be all right. I just know it. 20 minutes later, 2.30 in the morning, there's a call from the hospital. The head nurse on the ward I'm in says, in these words, Mr. Welshans, there has been a miracle. Your son's fever has broken. He's awake, he's alert, there doesn't seem to be any significant paralysis, and he's demanding pancakes. <laughs> and I still love pancakes, so this goes to show that even coming close to dying doesn't cure desire. <laughs> now, I went through a pretty happy childhood after that, although there were a couple of years of recuperation and rehabilitation, and uh, so I spent most of my time at home alone when most of my compatriots were out playing and so on. Um, I later saw that as a gift the universe had given me because it trained me actually to be alone. And although I was surrounded with a lot of love, I didn't have the social interactions that children my age were having. So later in life, when I wanted to spend long weeks alone in a meditation cave, it was much easier for me. And sometimes I think we can look at these situations in life where life doesn't give us what we want or what we think we want or what the society thinks we should have or what we need to be happy. And my experience is there's usually a gift in each of those experiences, in, in not getting what you want. It's an interesting thing. In recent years, the law of attraction has become very popular in our culture. And the book, The Secret, was very popular for a long time. Sold millions and millions of copies. And basically, the interesting thing was it was nothing new and it wasn't a secret, but it was a great marketing plan. And, um, the secret was basically, this is the secret to getting everything you want. Which is fascinating and, and perfectly understandable that that would be big in our culture because that's what our culture is about. Whereas in Buddhist culture, 
The secret to happiness is not getting what we want, it's getting free of wanting. Getting free of wanting. So now I move into my uh, teenage years, and when I was 11, my parents started drinking again, and our happy home turned from what I thought was a heaven realm into a hell realm, just overnight. And I grew up really seeing, for the first six months, I was sobbing every night because my parents were having these vicious arguments. And just crying, crying myself to sleep. And at one moment, about six months into this, I heard in my own mind, I suddenly realized, oh my God, I'm the most mature person in the house. <laughs> and I was 12 years old. I thought, holy mackerel, I, I got a problem here. And then I thought, well, if I'm going to survive this, I have to not feel. I have to stop feeling. And I went through most of my teenage years and into my early 20s pretty, in a pretty robotic state. Uh, and occasionally when my feelings did come to the surface, I, they usually resulted in me wanting to commit suicide. Fortunately, because I've had this very blessed life, blessed with lots of joy and lots of suffering. <laughs> Every time I was about to do myself in, somebody would whisper in my ear, I don't know who, I think I know who, but somebody would whisper in my ear and say, hang in there, it might get better. Now when I was 18, I had some extraordinary transcendent experiences which fit right into William James' definitions of classical mystical experience. And that was the turning point in my life. Because what I experienced was that I went into a realm where none of this existed. And where there was just one. One consciousness, one awareness, one source from which it was clear all of this springs. And coming back into normal, what we call normal waking consciousness, the first thing that I thought was that this whole identity was a dream. And I had tasted something so real the only real experience I'd ever had. And what it led to was an understanding that what we're doing here in these bodies, in these personalities, with these minds, is endeavoring to find our way back into that place of oneness. And so, you know, again, when I'm sorry I can't comment on anybody else's presentations because I haven't heard them yet, but Phillips was so good when he talked about the importance of connection, the importance of the, the fact that we are social beings. So it comes full circle back to the fact that if we are this identity, this one consciousness, let me just put it to you in terms of... Um, uh, quantum physics. We know through quantum physics that, um, again, I'm going to take, take shortcuts, scientific shortcuts. Basically, what we know is that there's, in this entire physical universe, there's only one thing, and that it's light. And there actually is only one light. And that one light manifests in all of these different forms. And if we could look at all of this through an electron microscope or reduce it down to its finest form, we would see that it's all just that one light moving in and out of different forms. Now to understand consciousness in Eastern terms, uh, as human beings we have a consciousness that is capable of experiencing that one light directly. And we get little glimpses of it 
in the experiences as human beings that we find most ecstatic, like love, like joy, like peace. When we're in those states, we're getting little glimpses of this larger, greater identity. In other words, in love, we're experiencing our oneness with another human being. Unfortunately, because we have our human mind, those experiences don't last very long. <laughs> so we you know, meet someone on an elevator, <laughs> and we look in their eyes, and we go, oh, yes, you're the one. I love you. And you go out, and you have this wonderful date, and it's all beautiful. And you go and start telling your friends, oh, I've, met the, I've met the one. I've met the person of my dreams. Now, within a few weeks, you're saying to them, now, you are the person of my dreams, but when you start behaving the way I want you to, I'll be happy. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> How did we lose that ecstatic experience? It's like a fellow came into one of my meditation classes recently, and I run a regular class on Wednesday nights back in New Jersey. So this fellow came in, and he sat down and he just glared at me, just glared at me. And uh, I thought, I wonder what he's thinking, feeling, experiencing. Class was over, he left, he came back the next week. I was shocked. He sat there glaring at me again. This time he literally sat like this. You know, the statue of the thinker. So he's looking at me like this. And I'm thinking, I, finally, it came a moment for questions. And I said, anybody have any questions? This fellow raises his hand. And he says, um, can you tell me something? I said, I don't know. He said, if love and, he said, you've been saying that love and peace and joy are our true nature. If that is true, where on earth did we go wrong? <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, you know, that's the best question anyone has ever asked me in a meditation class. Because that's really the essence of it. And I said, the answer to the question is we think. We think. See, if you, and, and I'm not saying this to denigrate the human mind. It's an extraordinary device. But the problem is when we're thinking, we're always outside the moment. See, I say something and you say, oh, that's interesting. I have to think about that. And the next thing you know, you haven't heard another thing I've said for 10 minutes. You know, or your stomach growls and you say, oh, gee, I'm hungry. I wonder what we're going to have for lunch. I wonder, well, maybe there's a restaurant nearby I can go to. Hmm. And you haven't heard anything I've said for 10 minutes, you know. Now, that comes back to the faculty of attention. So what does attention do? In the Vedas, when, we say, when the Vedas say, if you could bring your attention to exactly what's happening in this moment, you would see God. And then, of course, in Buddhism, we don't talk about God, but we just talk about attention. <laughs> in other words, rather than focusing on the goal, we seek its focus on the path. The path being attention. How do we bring our mind into the present moment? In the present moment, we're much more likely to be compassionate. And we understand compassion as the experience of our essential connection with another human being. It's so like when we talk about the difference between pity and compassion. We talk about... Um, Pity being an experience, actually, of separateness. It's that experience when we look at someone who's suffering and we say, isn't it a shame that they're having that suffering? And a little voice in us is saying, I'm sure glad it's not me. Or someone I love. Oh, but I'll be kind to them. Compassion is the experience where another person's suffering is my suffering. We are suffering, thus suffering. And that, the interesting thing is when I was studying with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross back in the 1970s, one of the first things she said, and this was before people were talking about compassion fatigue, but she said, you know, we're understanding that 
The cause of burnout is not feeling feelings. The cause of burnout is not feeling feelings. It's pushing feelings away. It's a very interesting thing. It takes a lot of energy to not feel what you're feeling. And I'll often say to people who come to me and say, I'm so exhausted. Well, there may be a physiological problem, but is there some essential emotion in your life that you're not wanting to feel? Some essential emotion in your being that you're pushing away. And many of us can find that. Now, my parents had everything that this culture thinks you need to be happy. They had money, they had a beautiful home, they had fancy cars, my mother had minks and diamonds, and my father had prestige. They were absolutely miserable. And, you know, in the course of my life, I've had the experience of knowing lots and lots of wealthy people. I know very few who are happy. But the interesting thing is, whenever I meet a wealthy person who is happy, I'm so fascinated, I have to ask, what is it in your life that makes you so happy? And the fascinating thing is, they never say, oh, it's my fancy cars and my big homes and my place on the Riviera, my jet airplane. They never say that. They always say the same thing. Can you guess what it is? It's helping other people. It's using my money to help others. Establishing connection. So that, you know, wealth gives us a tremendous ability to be separate. And in so doing, doesn't generally make us happy. So, um, to come back to what... Vedanta and Buddhism see as our true identity, it would be best described as awareness itself. An awareness beyond thought, beyond opinion, beyond physical identity. So the reason for the blank screen is because it's an interesting analogy to the way we describe the difference between mind and awareness. And so it's often said that our awareness is like a blank movie screen and that our mind is, there is a projector with a light in it that projects images onto the screen. So the mind is like the light in the projector and the lens and the images that pass through either on celluloid film or through a computer magic somehow, um, those are thoughts. The mind is the light projecting the thought. The thoughts are the images that are projected on the screen. But behind all of it, we are just pure awareness. And so to come full circle, that awareness, because it's free of all of the angst and anxiety and suffering of being a human being, and because it never changes, it never goes anywhere, it's always a part of us. So we always have awareness. You, you, your thoughts you require awareness. But your awareness doesn't require thought. And you can experience awareness most directly the more you quiet down your thinking mind. And look at the things that we do to do that. You know, the, the moments in which we transcend thought and are just in pure ecstatic experience. And you have that experience, which you can get to in a variety of different ways, but that experience of, oh, this feels so good. This is what I was born to feel. And then you see right away it's gone. And it's gone because, not because the experience itself or the, the state of awareness, consciousness, that is that experience went away. It's the mind came back to work. Like the mind that says, I love you, you know, that wonderful, there was a play on Broadway in New York a few years ago called, I love you, you're perfect, now change. <laughs> I mean, that's what our mind does. The mind is constantly thinking about the past and the future, 
either, and it's constantly liking and disliking. It's very simple. It reduces down to what a computer does, which a computer really only knows yes and no. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So that all of computer programming is very elaborate usages of the yes response, no response. So our mind really thinks about the past, thinks about the future, and likes and dislikes. So we think about the past either with longing, oh, I was so happy then, I'm not happy now. Or we think about the past, of, oh, I can't believe what my parents did to me. I'll never be normal. I'm so angry about what happened 40 years ago. Or we think about the future. Oh, I get to go on vacation in three years. I'll be happy then. <laughs> or, what if I get to that island and there's a hurricane? Liking, disliking, past and future, fearing, aversion, all very fascinating what the mind does. So these practices that we're talking about today, and I think uh, Anne Klein will talk quite a bit about Buddhist meditation practice and attention this afternoon, but are basically ways of tricking the mind into slowing down. Because as we said, as Phil said this morning, if you tell the mind, don't think, well, forget about it. <laughs> and that is the number one misunderstanding about the practice of meditation is the thought that it requires the cessation of thought. So you may slip into a place of consciousness that is beyond thought, but you don't get there by trying to stop thinking. What you do is you keep diverting your attention to something else. And in the Buddhist tradition, it's primarily sensation in the body, where you just try to experience the sensation that's happening now. It has no mystical significance. It's just happening now and there's always sensation in the body. And then we try to explore the qualities of different mental states, the qualities of moods, the qualities of different thoughts. What does each kind of thought, how does your body respond to a certain kind of thought? When you're fearful, you know how your body responds, often tightening in the stomach, perspiration, dryness in the mouth. It's like a friend of mine said to me recently, a wonderful fellow. <laughs> He's quite a character. He said to me, John, have you ever had that experience where your mouth is dry but you're wet every place else? <laughs> <laughs> That's what fear does to you. <laughs> so we learn to, through silence, through inactivity, learn to find our way into that essential place of silence and inactivity in our own being. Now, in a way, I think what happens when, when we have a good relationship with a parent, a good healthy relationship, again, I'm gonna go back to something Phil said, you know, if your parent is anxious, you're probably gonna grow up anxious. If your parent is angry, that's going to have a big effect on you. If your parent is loving and peaceful, that's going to have a big effect on you. And so we're picking up, the way I would say it, because I've drifted away from science, I confess. <laughs> but the way I would say it is vibrationally, you're picking up from your parents their state of consciousness. And it starts happening even in the womb with your mother. You know, you have awareness as a fetus in the womb and you're picking up biologically through um, sharing her blood and her body giving you nutrition, you're picking up so much from your mother. And so all of this goes to creating a certain environment in which we grow up. Now. I just want to say that my work and my understanding is 
that that environment can always be seen ultimately as a gift, at least in adult life. That whatever it is, I truly believe that there is no trauma that in and of itself can ruin a human being. Because I've worked with people who have been through the most extraordinary traumas who are happy, well-adjusted human beings. Took some work to get there. But the truth of the matter is that suffering, um, you know, there's this statement, suffering is grace. And I um, unwisely and uncompassionately said that to a friend of mine when I was just starting out dealing with these traditions. And he was talking about his abusive parents and I said, suffering is grace. And he said, and I think I might inflict some on you right now. <laughs> but very interesting, that same friend became, he and I grew up with similar parents. He became a very serious, very angry alcoholic and an attorney, which is a very volatile combination. You know. And... Um, he once looked at me and he said, how is it that you're so happy? And I said, I forgave my parents. And he said, I'm not forgiving my parents. Those bastards, you know, <laughs> and went on and on. That was about 15 years ago. And he's now in AA and he's getting sober and he's realizing what it means to forgive his parents. In that context, forgiveness means not approving of unconscious or cruel behavior. Basically, what it means is if I want to live in this state of peace, this thing that the Hindus call the Atman, this thing that they're also called Samadhi or Satchitananda, that the Buddhists call Nirvana, that Christians call Christ consciousness, if I want to live in that place of love and peace and joy, and I want to flirt with the possibility that it's in me, as long as my mind is filled with anger, I can't live in that place. As long as I'm filled with resentment, I can't live in that place. So one sort of poetic way of saying it is that forgiveness is the process of removing the boulder of resentment that is blocking the entrance to our own heart. That's really what it is. It's when you come down to the realization that I can't change any other human being on earth. All I can do is change my own perspective. And how do I do that? Well, I've found it difficult, as we were saying earlier, to replace one thought with another it creates a lot of tension in the mind. So to learn how to soften around it, to create um, an environment which is conducive to the natural arising of compassion. One of my, uh, I had a great experience many years ago, I was with Ram Dass at a retreat on compassion, and we're walking down a path, and um, this fellow comes up, and he says, Ram Dass, here's my problem, I really don't think that I care. In all honesty, I just don't think I give a, you know what, <laughs> about anybody except myself. And at that moment, Ramdas tripped over a rock and started to fall, and this guy spontaneously went, and Ramdas looked at him, he said, I just busted you. <laughs> because if you think about it, you might not feel it. If you can get into the place where that is your true nature, it arises spontaneously. So if we quiet our minds, and work on opening our hearts, compassion naturally arises. Connection naturally arises. Healing naturally arises. So the last thing I'll share with you is that when I'm sitting with someone who comes to me for counseling, the first thing I do is recognize that there is a place in them that is pure and holy and sacred and beyond all of the melodrama that has brought them to see me today, there is a place of clear awareness, pure awareness. 
And the best thing I can do to help them is to be in that place in my own being. And then to listen with an open heart and compassion without any preconceived notion of how this is all supposed to turn out. Just the secure knowledge that they in themselves have the resources to heal whatever this is. So I think that um, it's time for questions. Is that right? Yeah? OK. <laughs> Can you address uh, the neurophysiologists tell us they've reduced the mind to the brain. And you can look with functional um, studies and you, you know that's all you see. Uh, do, you, do you have a comment? I do. I disagree. <laughs> um, but what I do with that is that when, we're, when I'm teaching meditation, um, one of the things that we can do very easily is be aware of the vastness of our awareness. In other words, right now, sitting here in this room, we're all aware of each other. We're aware of the entire space in the room. We're aware of the street out there and cars passing by. We're aware of much more than just this thing here this, that facilitates the process of thinking. So that I'll ask people to say, to, to just allow for the possibility that awareness is not entrapped in your brain. It is not, the process of thinking happens in the brain, sort of, but um, and you can trace changing emotions and mental states and moods and things you can see on brain scans. But that isn't the totality of it in this tradition. Now, I'm not sitting here saying, trying to proselytize and saying that what I see is truth. I'm just saying you could allow for the possibility <laughs> of seeing it a little differently. Now, one of the interesting bits of evidence is that most of us have had the experience of having someone we haven't thought of in years pop into our mind suddenly. And then within a short period of time, the phone rings and they're calling us or we get an email or a letter. Now my question is always, how would that happen if we weren't all bound together in some vast field of consciousness in which that message comes through at some subliminal level before the actual event happens. So that is just something I'd invite you to play with today. Just realize that your awareness fills this room and extends out beyond the room. And then we could say that awareness extends out as beyond infinity, ultimately, because if it's all this one being, one consciousness, one light, then it's all tied together, which literally means that whatever suffering is present on this planet in this moment, we're all experiencing at some level. And whatever joy is present, we're all experiencing at some level. Several of the words that you used uh, kind of resonated with me, like talking about forgiveness, acceptance, tolerance, uh, in the same breath of someone who's also actively seeking. It's an Im important process to achieve or state to achieve. It does seem to me harder with people who've experienced significant levels of uh, physical or sexual abuse to get to those different states. I wonder if you could tell a story of somebody you worked with and how that happened, how you uh, helped them to navigate those, uh, those struggles. Hmm. That's a great question. Because it is true, and I remember exploring this with Ramdas at one point, that uh, 
I said, you know, the one thing that I see is there are certain um, experiences of childhood trauma, especially abuse and or sexual abuse, uh, which create a situation of such um, anxious and avoidant attachment that um, it's a very, very hard thing to transcend. So what the, the way that I generally work with people is to start out sometimes by, after hearing the story, saying, well, are there any moments when you feel happy? No. You never feel happy? Do you ever laugh? Well, sure I laugh. What do you feel when you laugh? Um, are there any circumstances in which you feel at peace? No, I'm never peaceful. Never? You know, like last week, I was w working with a woman on the telephone. We're doing, she was in Alaska. And um, she had a history of uh, childhood sexual abuse and, f and physical abuse. And um, she said, you know, I wake up every morning anxious. I said, the moment you wake up, you're anxious? She said, well, no. I have about three seconds of not being anxious before the anxiety comes in. I said, aha, those three seconds are the key to your release, to your healing. Now, what is different in those three seconds? She goes, well, I'm not thinking. Aha. <laughs> so what do you do when you get anxious? She says, oh, I just start to sweat and my heart palpitates and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I said to her, she, we'd, she'd been to one of my retreats, and she had done different forms of practice, and including walking meditation. Walking meditation is a wonderful thing to use for anxiety, because sometimes it's so hard to just sit still that if you get up and do something and move, and walking meditation is like this. In my tradition, we use something called noting, which is where you use words to note what it is you're doing. When we're breathing, it's very simple. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. You know, you can do that for three months. And then, uh, but you take breaks and you do walking meditation, which is lift, move, place, shift. Lift, move, place, shift. Lift, move, place, shift. Well, that's a more... Um, uh, uh, an experience of more the physical being, the gross being, and gross not disgusting, just physical. <laughs> and um, so that, she started doing that, and she said, wow, that's amazing. I said, what happens? She said, well, I wake up, I have three seconds of peace, I start to get anxious, and now I get up and I do walking meditation. And I say, and then what happens? She said, well, I, I make it to the bathroom without being anxious. And I said, okay, then uh, how about in the shower? You really pay attention to the experience of the shower. Wow, that's amazing. So basically, you know, without belaboring the point, it's the, the practice of meditation, again, is not to deny any feeling, not to deny any emotion, not to deny any thought. Allow it all to be there, but it begins to exist in this much wider field of awareness. So that when you start to experience your being as bigger than this little body that was abused and taken advantage of, and you realize that there's a pure essence in you that is so much bigger, then the traumas of life don't go away, but they exist in a much smaller realm. You know, I was going to tell this story a, a few minutes ago. I had the thought, I was sitting in a restaurant a couple of years ago, and there was a little baby, an infant, in an infant seat on the floor, and the baby's parents were having dinner. And um, the baby was wailing and crying, and they weren't paying atten any attention to him. And I just looked down, I looked in his eyes, and I silently said, sweetie, why are you crying so much? And I honestly thought I heard the little baby say, I'm crying because I'm wondering how I got back into one of these things. Oh my God, am I this small? and I can't speak the language these people are speaking, and I am peeing all over myself. <laughs> Just awful. So, you know, a large part of our problem is thinking that we are this small, and it's very constricting. 
So. One more question before lunch. It's, uh, <coughs> it's uh, uh, similar to the last one, but it's, uh, it is different. Uh, a comment, I see a lot of uh, people who have trouble being kind to themselves. Do you have any recommendations as uh, for people to, who struggle with self-care? Ah, very interesting. Well, this is something that is important for everybody in this room to focus on because there's an interesting thing that happens that when we're motivated to help others, we often have a tendency to feel if I do anything for myself, it's selfish. And so when you're, my feeling is like Gandhi, one of my heroes, uh, was once a mother brought a child to him and said, Gandhiji, my child is diabetic. Would you tell him to stop eating sugar? And Gandhi looked at her and he said, can you come back in one week? And she was kind of perplexed, but she said, okay. So she went away and they came back a week later. And um, Gandhi looked at her little boy and he, she said, now your mother is very concerned about you and you must stop eating sugar because it's going to make you sick. And the mother thanked him and said, well, that was wonderful. Thank you, Gandhiji. But why did I have to come back a week later? And he looked at her and he said, last week I was eating sugar. <laughs> So that all leads into what I, the, the response to the question is I think that whatever you want to ask someone who you are endeavoring to help to do, you ought to be really good at doing yourself. Now if you want people to care for themselves, know how and why it's important to care for yourself. There's an, an, a story I tell sometimes when I'm working with people in um, hospital settings where I, I'm doing workshops on not burning out. And I'll ask everybody in the group, what's the most, what do you think is the most important organ in the human body? Anyone? Oh, that's interesting. Okay, most people will say the heart. Although I was with a group of doctors once and they got into an argument about whether it was the heart, the brain, or the liver. So, but most people say the heart. So the most important organ in the body, the heart. The heart's job is to send nutrition throughout the body. It's pumping the blood. The blood carries the food that sustain our bodies throughout. Now, the human heart has an inherent wisdom in the sense that it knows, I'm assuming it knows, that if it, does, if it isn't healthy, it can't help, it can't do its job. So the human heart feeds itself before it sends the nutrition out to the rest of the body. And it's kind of like that thing on the airplane where they say if you're with someone who needs help and the oxygen masks come down, put your own oxygen mask on first People come to me and they say, how do I work with people who are grieving? And I say, well, become very good at handling your own grief. Become very familiar with it and know how to deal with it in a healthy way. It's really like being a lifeguard at the beach. You know, if you want to save people who are drowning, you have to be a strong swimmer. So it's really the same principle. Um, I guess that's it. For those of you who aren't too familiar with St. Paul's, there are an awful lot of nice places to sit and eat in where, where you came in.